All right, welcome to the NDSU Extension High Tunnel Webinar Series. So this is our April seminar. Jan Knodel is going to be presenting on spider mites in high tunnel crops, and she's very, she's actually writing an extension publication on this on this topic. So this is really fresh for her. Um, but Dr. Jan Knodel is our NDSU Extension Entomologist, and she was recently promoted to full professor. Um, so congratulations on that, Jan. Thank now, you. Now, Jan's primary responsibilities include insect pests of field crops, but she also uh, covers horticultural crops. And in fact, we are co-advising a PhD student that is studying spotted wing drosophila, and we're also working on pollinator research. So Jan's program is, is very broad, um, but we're so... Uh, we're so um, happy to have her joining us today because spider mites is a very important pest in high tunnel crops. All right, thank you, Jan. I'm just going to mute my microphone and I'll I'll let you take it away. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Good. So, well, thank you for the invitation to speak to you today, and I'm probably going to be speaking on probably the most challenging pests to control in high tunnel crops. And I've worked with it in field crops, as Esther mentioned, my, probably my main priority is working in field crops and we've had spider mite infestations in soybeans and field corn. So I'm very familiar with the two spotted spider mite at least. So, and <clears throat> Prior to coming to NDSU, I did work at the Beltsville USDA uh, greenhouses on the uh, leaf miner of chrysanthemums. So <clears throat> we'll get started with the two spotted spider mate. And this is probably the most common one that you're going to see in the high tunnels. You can see this with your eye even though it is very tiny, and you can identify it by the two dark spots on the back, sort of on the side of the abdomen there. They're generally found on the undersides of the leaf, but you can find them crawling around um, any time of the day um, on the upper surface, anywhere in the plant. Uh, the life cycle of the two-spotted spider mite has um, an egg and then it goes through the larval stage, which most mites are closely related to spiders, so they have eight legs compared to insects with six legs. But in some of the immature stages, they only have six legs, which you can see in the larvae uh, life stage. And then it goes through a proto-nymph stage, deuteronymph, and then the adult. And the thing about spider mites is they can get into a lot of different uh, plants from trees, ornamentals, to our field crops. So they're a, a very common and uh, pest on many different plants. In general, here in North Dakota, they overwinter as eggs. Um, either in the soil or on the vegetation. Development uh, of the whole life cycle is relatively short. Um, it depends on the temperature. They can take as little as five days to go through their whole life cycle or as long as 19 days. And in general, they crawl. They, they don't have wings like insects but they crawl and then they spin strands of silk. That's where they get the name spider. Um, and they use this, they'll crawl up to the tops of the plants and then the wind will blow, or in the case of a high tunnel, you'll have the fans blowing through the high tunnel and they'll move from plant to plant by these silk strands. The since they are so small, it's difficult to look for them. So oftentimes we recommend growers to look for the damage symptoms. And the feeding that a mite does is kind of different from other types of piercing sucking. 
insects like aphids that feed on the phloem of uh, plants or their plant juices. But the spider mite has a very needle-like mouth part and they inject it into an individual plant cell and then they'll extract the entire contents of that plant cell, including the green chloroplast that um, gives the plant that green color. And as a result, you end up with these, it looks like little stipples um, on the leaves. And, and when, eventually those will coalesce and you'll get patches of yellowing um, in the leaf. So this is a good indication that you have spider mites and you should turn the leaf over to look for mites and webbing. And then here's a close up of what the webbing uh, looks like. And in um, 2012, we had a drought year, and spider mites can do a much high, higher populations during drought and dry weather. And you can see the webbing on the flower as well. And they also can get attached to you when workers are moving around in the high tunnel. They can actually be moving spider mites around and not know it. <clears throat> so we know that drought uh, favors mite outbreaks and in the high tunnels we have kind of extremes of temperature. It can get hotter than the outside and then in the evenings it can actually get cooler than the outside. So if we have a dry summer, which it is forecast for a drought in North Dakota this upcoming year, uh, spider mites may become a worse pest problem. And what they're doing is um, many of the grasses that they feed on, maybe outside of the uh, high tunnel, are starting to deteriorate and die because it's so dry. And then they move looking around for new hosts with, with better food quality and nutrition. Another reason mites have uh, are, do very well in the dry conditions is because fungal diseases that normally attack and infest the mites are um, lower when we have dry conditions. And the diseases are generally favored by cooler temperatures and high humidity. And also because of the reproduction cycle being so short and temperature dependent, we have a much higher reproductive rate when it's drought conditions with the hot, high temperatures. So uh, we already kind of went over the feeding and how they feed on individual plant cells, but the, you may see stippling or white spots, and as it progress and it gets worse, you'll see leaf yellowing and bronzing, and then eventually you may see leaf drop, and hopefully you won't let it get to this point, uh, but this would be a severe infestation. And they generally say, say if you see in the webbing from mites, it's already a high level of infestation. So you try to avoid getting to the point where you see the, like, the webbing encasing the whole flower or the leaf, because um, that's indication that it's already past the economic damage level. <clears throat> Feeding generally starts down towards the bottom of the plant and then moves upward. And this is true on just other mite species as well. So a good place to start to scout just, you know, towards the bottom of the bottom leaves. And this does uh, impact your yield. Uh, spider mites can impact yield all the way up through uh, maturity. So they reduce the photosynthetic ability and water loss goes up. And as a result, you can get reduced fruit set. So there is some other mites that have been reported in high tunnels and there's the tomato russet mite. And 
I should have pointed out the family for the two spotted, but this is a different family, Aerophyidae. And most of us are already familiar with this group. If you've seen gulls on some of the trees, like the maples, those are Aerophyid mites as well that cause those gulls. But the tomato russet mite feeds specifically on plants in the Solanaceous family. So our tomatoes and eggplants. Uh, they're very, very tiny. As you can see in the picture, um, it's difficult to get a good picture of them. Uh, they're less than 0.1 millimeters. So the, you, can prob you can see them, but it's very difficult to see them. You're gonna pr probably need to invest in a 20X hand lens. And then we use a microscope to confirm that they're present on a, a plant. So, and another important thing when it comes to control, if you do have the tomato russet mite, uh, the controls that you use for the two spotted mites may or may not be effective on this mite. So you need to be aware of that. We'll talk a little more about uh, chemical control later. But here's what some of the damage looks like. Um, they cause desiccation of leaves and, and russeting in the fruit, a bronzing on the stem. And you can see some of the darkening here on the stem, a bronzing of the leaf, dead tissue. Now, when you go to look for them, you don't want to look at this dead one. They're probably off that. You want to go up and find the next green leaf or partially green leaf and look for them there. Um, they're <clears throat> kind of difficult to find, so we do use the symptoms rather than, you know, looking for the mites. Um, and look for the bronzing. This is a severe infestation here on this tomato. You can see how it's just bronze. A lot of times people mistake this for herbicide injury or disease. And one of the other mites, this one's less common and you know we probably will not see it here in, in North Dakota, but there's also another mite that's been recorded on vegetables and uh, leafy greens that we might grow in high tunnels and that's the broad mite. And you'll notice again, it's in a different, different family, Tarsonemidae, and it's um, very, um, Tiny, just like the other um, mite, microscopic. So you're going to need that 20x hand lens or microscope again. Um, you can see the scanning electron micrograph here of the mite. This one's a little more um, oval, where the tomato russet mite is a little more long. And some people describe that one as cone-shaped. But they vary in uh, color. Uh, they're kind of clear or uh, clear colored when they first hatch and then once they feed they can get more brown or reddish colored. And one thing about the eggs, if you do see any eggs under the microscope, they're very characteristic and you can use this for identification of broad mites. They have these um, little tubercles on the top of the egg, and that's unique to this particular species. If you do see this, you can use that for identification. And some people kind of refer to these tubercles as the little jewels on top of the egg. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so you can also see this mite in high tunnels. They like the um, lower temperatures compared to like our two-spotted mite that likes it hot. Um, and dry, and these also like the higher humidity, so they have a little different niche. Uh, the damage um, is kind of similar to the russet mite, where you, but these uh, mites inject a salva, a toxic uh, salva, uh, into the plant, and this causes browning and blackening of the new growth. And this arrow here is pointing to one of the mites. And you just see it as a white spot. 
but as a result, we get um, distortion of the uh, foliage, twisting, curling, and it also causes some hardening of the tissue and uh, cupping of young leaves. And this one can be mistaken for viruses or herbicide damage as well. <clears throat> well, uh, we want to use IPM whenever we talk about management of insect pests. And <clears throat> one of the keys to IPM, or integrated pest management, is pest identification and monitoring. And in the high tunnels, we really probably don't use thresholds um, or predictive models, but those are some other key elements of IPM. So today I'll be talking about um, our different strategies, which are over on the right side here. And we'll start off with chemical control. I usually do that last, but I thought I'd do it first for a change. So scouting, number one principle in IPM, when you're out there scouting, we need to know how to identify our pests and the good insects out there. There's many predaceous mites, which are good insects eating our plant feeding mite species. So we'll uh, go into a little more detail on the beneficials later. But for mites, because they have such a fast reproductive rate, we recommend you get out, well, we prefer twice a week to look for them, but at least weekly at a minimum. And again, they're so difficult to see. Um, you know, look for that speckling, the damage symptoms, instead of you know the mites. But you can also the two spot. It's easy to see. But some of the others, like the um, russet mite and the broad mite, they're down sometimes in buds and in the joints um, where the leaves and stuff come together, so they're very difficult to see. And in the uh, field crops, we've used this white sheet of paper method, which would be easy to use in your high tunnels as well. We just put a white piece of paper on a clipboard, and then you put that underneath the plant, and then tap on the plant vigorously to dislodge the mites from the plant, and then you'll see them crawling around as little dots on the white sheet of paper. And then you can use your hand lens to see if it's the two spotted mite or microscope probably to see if it's one of the other species. Uh, we don't have traps available for mites, um, <clears throat> although they could crawl onto some of the yellow sticky uh, traps that we use for trapping other pests like white flies and aphids and sweet uh, spotted winged drosophila. So um, <clears throat> you, you may see a few on there, but in general, they're gonna stick to the uh, plant and the undersides of the leaves. And I do have a video um, on scouting for sp spider mites and soybeans if you wanna watch that. Uh, you, you don't have to write that link down. You can just go and um, Google um, NDSU Extension YouTube and sp scouting for spider mites in soybean, you can, it'll pop up. But I do demonstrate that tapping method on the white sheet of paper. Uh, for chemical uh, guidelines, spider mites, especially because they're on the lower leaves and the bottom of the plant and the underside, make sure you use enough volume. Coverage is um, critical for effective control. And if you're having um, favorable environmental conditions for mites, the drought, um, or you already have high populations and you caught it late, you know, use that higher labeled rate. And then we do have pyrethroid insecticides uh, registered for control of mite. However, most of them will flare mite populations. There's only one active ingredient, bifenthrin, that is effective for control of spider mites. So and we have to be very careful with spider mites and what we spray because they can easily develop 
insecticide resistance. We'll talk about that. Um, but once you spray, <clears throat> you'll want to go back and rescout to see how well your insecticide or your miticide did. Um, most of the insecticides will not control the mite eggs. They do not. So those eggs will be hatching and you will have to do a second spray and then you'll need to rotate your modes of action so to use a, a different um, spray like organophosphate or miticide if you sprayed with bifenthrin your first. So you do not use the same mode of action twice. And this is some um, more from soybeans, but it's a good demonstration. <clears throat> it shows you from uh, an airplane, of course this wouldn't apply, but the same type of thing can apply to when we're going over and spraying. Um, it's gonna mainly, most of the uh, deposits, spray deposits go in the top part of the plant. Only 30% reach the lower leaves. Then if we look at the upper surface, 62% landed in the upper surface, 38% in the lower surface. And if we look at the distal, inner versus outer leaf, most of it was in the outer leaf. So you can see how the mites are cryptic and they're hard to see. Uh, they're on the underside of the leaf and it's difficult to get insecticides to reach them and do a good job with control. So um, sometimes we become too dependent on our insecticides and we misuse our insecticides. We use the same one repeatedly for the same pass. And as a result, this can lead to insecticide resistance. And uh, furthermore, you might be dealing with multiple species of mites. And it's important to realize that some of the miticides and insecticides are only effective against certain species of mites. So pesticide resistance is common um, in a lot of insects. And there's over 500 insects worldwide that have insecticide resistance. And we're seeing cross resistance becoming more prevalent in insect pest species. And this means when you're using insecticide, make sure you're switching. Um, if they're resistant to one, these are all pyrethroids on the slide. If you're switching from like warrior to another pyrethroid, well, if they're resistant to warrior, they're resistant to all pyrethroids. So make sure you know your different families and modes of action of um, different insecticides so you don't get resistance. And cross resistance is when one insecticide confers resistance to other insecticides because it's the same mode of action or mechanism. <clears throat> so how does it develop? Well, we go out and we spray, and there's usually just a few survivors that may be tolerant or resistant, have actual genetic resistance. Uh, sometimes it's just a physiological resistance where they're able to detoxify the insecticide. Um, but anyway, we continue to spray and we use the same insecticide, so eventually we end up with a growing population of resistance. And then finally, we end up with a population that's almost entirely resistance. And most likely at this stage, it's probably in the genes. And we end up with a insect that has a hard shell, no matter what we throw at it, it is able to uh, survive. And it's the one that's gonna be out there uh, as the main source of genetics for breeding. So we all too often, you know, before we know it, um, we end up with insecticide or miticide resistance and the pesticides become ineffective 
and then it's necessary to switch to modes of action and, and then this could repeat itself with the other mode of action. So that's why it's so critical that we um, conserve the tools that we have. So and here's some of the insecticides, miticides that are registered in high tunnels. The first two, Brigade and Danitol, are both 3A um, mode of action, which is a parethroid insecticide. And the IRAC, you can go to the IRAC website, just type in Insecticide Resistant Action Committee or IRAC, and you will find a complete website that lists all the insecticides available and their modes of action. And you can see then here we got some of the uh, lower ones, zeal, all the way down to acromite. These are all miticides. And miticides are um, much more expensive than our, like our parethrite insecticides. So and you can see uh, this here is a uh, two-spotted spider mite, and then broad mite, and then here's the tomato russet mite. So you can see there's a few things that will control <clears throat> all of them, but if you have uh, russet mite, you know, you don't have as big of a selection of insecticide tools to choose from. So and these are what is registered different crops, um, and uh, well, I guess we can ask questions about that later if you have some. And when you're out there spraying, remember that insecticides are like a windshield when you're driving down the road to everything else out there, including our beneficial insects, and not to mention our pollinators. So here's some of the botanical insecticides um, that you could use in high tunnels. Um, you really need to read the late and understand the labels. Um, there's so many different labels and trade names out there. Um, I didn't list like which crops were registered because there's so much variation depending on the label and whatever you have. Uh, but neem, these are the ones that had mites on the label and most of them don't do not list, um, they'll just say mites. So I wasn't sure if uh, it included broad mite and rusted mite for some of these. But one thing that would con probably control all the mites is these oil sprays, because uh, they suffocate, uh, the, they encase the whole mite and they suffocate it to death. Um, however, um, there's been some research that shows the predatory mites are able to, they have longer legs and they can climb out of these oils and survive. So that's a benefit for using this uh, uh, horticulture oil. <clears throat> then there's a safer insecticidal soap that you can use, but again, some of these botanicals you're going to need to spray um, more than once a week. Most of the synthetic pesticides that I showed you in the earlier table, you'll be able to get by with um, spraying at a weekly interval. But these botanicals are broken down easier by the sunlight and temperature, uh, so you're going to need to spray more frequently if you're going to use these. And then there's the perethrum from the extract of the chrysanthemum flower, Paganic, um, is uh, fairly good against mites. And then someone emailed me and asked me about sulfur. And yes, elemental sulfur is um, effective against the plant feeding mite species. Um, however, it's highly toxic to um, the predatory mites. And also, you have to be careful because a lot of uh, plants are phytotoxic to sulfur, especially if it's hot. So you'd have to do a test um, to see, you know, whatever you're going to be spraying it on. <clears throat> and I did find off the hightunnel.org site uh, some research that's been done with entopathogens. 
Bavaria bassiana is a uh, fungal disease that attacks insects. And they tested uh, two different strains against mites, the naturalist L strain, which is the ATCC um, strain of Bavaria, and then the Botanagard ES strain, GHA, for control spider mites and high towels. And they did this on strawberries and cucumbers. And, uh, <clears throat> and they didn't wait till they saw high populations of um, mites, they sprayed as soon as they started observing them infesting the plants. So, and you can see, let's see, I can't get my, my, my um, pointer to work, but the green line in, on the graphs are the control or untreated. And then the green line is the ATCC strain and then the GHA is the reddish line. Uh, the ATCC is the blue line. So you can see it worked uh, fairly well in both the um, strawberries. I mean it's slower acting. Most of these bioinsecticides are a little slower acting and control. You won't get that rapid knockdown that you see in synthetic insecticides and miticides. But you can see it did uh, decrease the mite population. And in general, um, they felt that the um, ATCC worked a little better earlier in the year when the temperatures were cooler. And then they felt that the GHA worked a little bit better later in the year, August, uh, when the temperatures were a little bit higher in the tunnels. And you can find the whole report on that website. Uh, and here's what they saw in yield differences. Um, they got good, good um, control. They didn't separate it out by treatment. <clears throat> but in general, using Bavaria, they saw a increase in the cucumbers 35% in 2009 and 25% in 2010 over the untreated or the control. So that looks um, <clears throat> fairly promising, but there has to be a lot more work done on these types of biopesticides. <clears throat> well, now I talk a little bit about some of the other strategies, uh, cultural uh, host plant resistance and biological control. Well, cultural control, uh, prevention, you know, we want to cool these tunnels down to make them more unfavorable for mite reproduction. You know, have the fans going uh, to try and reduce how hot it is during the day. And then when it's dry, <clears throat> we mentioned you know, how well the mites do. Well, dust. Uh, mites can uh, do well. They like dusty conditions. So maybe use a mulch between the rows, such as a ryegrass or some sort of mulch to keep the um, dust down and off the plants. And then before you bring plants in, um, I'm not sure if you're doing transplants or if you're planting from seed, but make sure you're not bringing pest already into the um, greenhouse when you're introducing new plants. And avoid wearing yellow <laughs> clothing. Uh, we use yellow as a attractive uh, trap um, for capturing many of the pests found in high tunnels. And then sanitation, when you do get a very heavily infested plant with mite, you know, go ahead, just pull that one out, get rid of it. So you don't, um, it doesn't spread from there. Oftentimes in mites, you will have uh, hot spots it's pretty common. And then because they're on the lower leaves, I saw some research where they suggested pruning the lower leaves and then discarding them and getting rid of them um, would, would help reduce the infestation. Um, however, you have to be careful you're not taking too many leaves off so it's not gonna affect the plant health. And then weeds, uh, if you keep the weeds mowed around the outside of the uh, tunnel, because they harbor a lot of pests, and two-spotted spider mite, as, as you know, gets on 
hundreds of different plants. So keeping the area weed free <clears throat> and mowed outside the tunnel will help prevent the movement into the tunnel. And then there's the suggestion <clears throat> of using screens can be fitted uh, for the tunnels as well <clears throat> to try and exclude them. <clears throat> and then crop rotation. <clears throat> this is something we've used for a long time. <clears throat> you know, don't in gardens we, we don't plant the tomatoes in the same location year after year. You know, try to move it around. And then I watched the video last night where they had developed this high tunnel. It was on wheels. And they actually moved it on this. It was kind of like a train track. And they had, were able to move the high tunnel around between years. So it's kind of an interesting idea. <clears throat> and then host plant resistance. There hasn't been a lot of work done in this area. Um, but take you know, take notes. If you notice a variety or a cultivar that has less mites, you know, make a note of that. Um, I did find some information on boa tomato had less mites than trusk tomato when they grew them side by side. Uh, so there is differences between the cultivars and varieties out there. So um, make a note of that. And uh, you know, there needs to be a lot more research on this area. And then finally, biological control um, can be very effective uh, for spider mites. And it's also commercially available, predators are. So it makes it easier for everyone to get on board with more sustainable approaches. So this is probably our number one predatory mite. Uh, Phytocelus persimilis, and this one is specific just to the two spotted spider mites, so it's highly dependent on it. It's a beautiful um, reddish uh, color, and note how much longer the uh, legs are, and that's because they run much faster than the two spotted mite. Uh, they're a predator, so they need to catch the two spotted mite. Uh, kind of a pear shape, uh, again, very tiny, 0.5 millimeters long. And the um, immatures and males are a little bit smaller and lighter. Eggs are kind of oblong colored. And they prefer kind of moderate temperatures, uh, the predators, and humidity, 70 to 80. Or some people, well, in North Dakota, we kind of consider that high, but... <laughs> um, <clears throat> They uh, don't do well when it gets real hot, like in some of the high tunnels in the summer, they'll get up into the 90s. Um, so that's not favorable for the, this particular predatory mite. And since they are dependent on the two-spotted spider mite, if, if that is not present, this will die out um, and you'll have to reintroduce it. Uh, for the life cycle, um, it's just like the other uh, plant feeding mites. It's a short life cycle. Uh, depends on temperature. It can take, um, you know, at a higher temperature, only five days. At a low temperature, at 59, is 25 days. Uh, they're fairly long-lived as um, adults, up to a month. And there's more females than males. Uh, so this is something we look for when we're evaluating uh, predators. We like to see more females because then you get more egg production um, and uh, better reproduction rate. Uh, they'll lay about 60 eggs in their lifetime or two to three per day. And the population can increase 44 times um, in 17 uh, days. So that's pretty good. They consume about 50 five to 50 prey per day. And they're commercially available from a lot of different uh, companies. And they um, are not recommended though as a preventative program. Uh, preventative is where you release something maybe just at the beginning when you see just a few mites. Um, they don't do well because they're so dependent on the two-spotted spider mite. And they don't feed on any other 
past present in the tunnel. So you might want to wait until that two spotted spider mite population has become somewhat established before you release them. And there's different release rates. You'll really need to work with your company or your insect tree uh, supplier um, on what they recommend. Uh, they're all kind of have a different recommendation. However, I found um, the 1,000 um, persimilis per 10,000 square feet was um, a result from a SARE study in high tunnels at Cornell University. So I felt that was a fairly good uh, number to, to go with. And if you do have a heavy infestation, um, you know, remove the heaviest infested plants and get rid of them. Then you may want to use a knockdown spray with maybe one of the bio pesticides to knock them down and then wait 48 hours before you release the mites. Uh, the, if you release them too late, the predatory mites will have a hard time catching up with the plant feeding mites that cause the damage. And then these are some of the other uh, species that are available and there's more. I didn't, I'm not listing all the predatory mites you can get from suppliers, but um, <clears throat> these are the Am Amblyceles californicus and, and the Amblyceles cucumerus. Uh, they're um, uh, two that are commercially available and fairly common. And these are more generalist feeders, which, um, th so they'll feed on other things you might have in your high tunnel, thrips uh, and aphids, and also the other mites, the russet and the broad mite. So uh, that makes them, uh, you know, maybe you want to do rather than just one predatory species, you know, consider doing two or three different species. So, and they're uh, very tiny as well. Well, they're first kind of a clear or whitish color and then they turn uh, brown or red. So, and you can get them uh, from different companies as well. They usually come with some uh, uh, sawdust or to keep them alive. And uh, they're, they're, they like a uh, little more hotter conditions as well, these predatory mites. They can take up to 90, but they like, um, I believe that's a typo, it's supposed to be 50 to um, 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And they can tolerate less humidity as well, down to 60, uh, whereas the uh, predatory mite uh, of the two spotted, that one likes the higher humidity. So they have a little bit different, and this one's better for preventative pest control. So you can release it a little bit earlier than you would the uh, other mite predator. Now you might take multiple applications, and this uh, 1,000 mite per 4,500 square foot was that SEER study from Cornell. And they had success um, in their tomatoes and cucumbers in high tunnel. Uh, with with these mites at Cornell University where they did the study. So and here's um, this is from the Cornell University and they uh, looked at the effect of the predatory mites on the control of the two spotted and unheated high tunnels and greenhouses. And uh, the rating here is zero. Um, you'll see the different uh, numbers. And the rating um, zero means it didn't work, it failed. Uh, three was the pest was controlled. Uh, five, the pest was eradicated. So and you can see what they have ratings for the different um, uh, predatory mites there. And you can see some were highly successful. Um, you know, most of them they had got good control with the um, uh, pet, uh, predatory species, so it's something not to consider. And if if you do try uh, the biological controls, this is probably the top five reasons why they don't work. Is maybe you introduce them too late, and they just can't catch up with the mite species feeding on your cucumbers and tomatoes. 
or um, you release too few of the beneficial predatory mites and the, the two spotted spider mite was too high or you had poor environmental conditions, uh, wide temperature swings in both temperature and humidity. And sometimes those predators just can't uh, tolerate that. And then also, um, you got to be familiar with your suppliers and make sure you uh, talk to them, know when they're shipping things out. Usually they have a particular day they would need your order in to get it shipped to you quickly within a few days. If you miss that time, you know, it might be the next week before you can get your shipment. So make sure you talk with your supplier and you're aware of their shipping requirements. And also, um, you know, check out the quality of their natural enemies. You know, if it's, is it supposed to have 500 emerging from this container? You know, do some checking to make sure they have um, good uh, reliability on their natural enemies. And I did run, run across some papers that actually looked at that from the different companies. Um, and then some uh, uh, crops, <clears throat> Um, can tolerate some pests, um, so maybe you may have a, a resistant variety. You know, maybe there's not enough mites on them to, um, uh, you know, have predatory mites get established. And here's some of the insectary suppliers. I listed some of them before, but there's a lot of them. You can go to this website where there's a whole list of all the suppliers of beneficial organisms in North America and uh, there's like hundreds so uh, find somebody who can work with you and uh, help you educate you as well on the use of these um, beneficials so but there is a lot of benefits to using uh, biological controls so um, you don't have to be worried about the synthetic pesticides and some of the toxicity issues if you have workers in your tunnel. There's no pre-harvest interval or re-entry intervals to be concerned about. You're not going to get any phytotoxic reaction or burn on the plants. And it's actually, they've done studies that show you're actually, although it takes a little time to re release these predators, it's not as much as, you know, spraying. Uh, mixing up, application, cleaning up, and all that. So, um, <clears throat> and it, it fits both the needs of conventional and organic growers. And another thing is, you know, we got to be concerned about our pollinators. Uh, and there's more than just the bees out there doing pollinator, pollination. There's surfeit flies, soldier beetles. And we recommend that you don't um, spray blooming plants. Uh, try to, you know, use least toxic pesticides if you do need to spray during bloom, but we really don't want sprays to go on during bloom. And then use um, short residual insecticides and most the uh, beekeepers tell you, you know, the evening is the best time to spray when the temperatures are quite uh, you know, below 55. There has been a recent paper that just came out in environmental entomology, leach and ASIC, and this is at Michigan State, and they did bee um, or pollinator observations in 10 minute periods in raspberry in bloom and hot, high tunnels, and they actually found <clears throat> uh, here the dark bar is the uh, high tunnel and they found significantly lower honeybee populations. Um, however, they didn't see that with the bumblebees, but they were releasing bumblebees into the high tunnels for pollination. And then they found significantly lower wild bees as well in the high tunnels. So it looks like the honeybees and the wild bees do not like to go into high tunnels. Um, so that's an interesting observation uh, that I wasn't aware of, that the tunnel actually seems to inhibit some of the bees. Actually. Jen, 
Yeah. This is Esther. I think, in fact, the tunnel does disorient the honeybees and the wild bees, but not the okay. bumblebees. Yeah, that's what they uh, were also found in this study. <clears throat> so, and that's all I had for you today. I'd be happy to take any questions. It looks like I'm on time. I didn't want to go too much over 45 minutes. Oh, Jan, it was just perfect. Okay. Uh, and we do have questions in the chat box. So I know, um, I know when we're dealing with spruce trees and spider mites, we talk about syringing. Does syringing work for high tunnel vegetable crops? So we're yes. using a spray of, of water. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, that can, can work. I, um, but you need a high pressure, you know, sometimes that you have to be careful because it can damage your plant. So you can um, use a high pressure to wash mites off and drown them. In fact, I've seen that in the um, soybean fields, usually before they have canopy closer, closure when they're smaller. It's easier to do that. Once the plant gets larger and has more leaves and canopy cover, then it's, it gets a little more difficult, but because the mites can hide, you know, down in the soil even. So it takes a Usually when it's been effective, it takes both wind and um, high pressure to get them off. Okay. Um, so a question on resistance. Um, can insecticidal or, or miticide resistance occur in a single growing season? I, it, yes, it could. Um, uh, down in Texas, I know where they have much higher pressures from mites and they have different species of mites as well but um, they can, it could occur uh, mites are very quick to adapt and their life cycle can be as short as five days so it, it could happen it's probably not it's more likely it would happen over several years but um, then, you know, just in one year. Mm -hmm. And then somebody wanted to know where they could access the, the list of insecticides and miticides. So I think you... That is, um, let's see. I got that off. I'm assuming you'll be posting the webinar. Yes. I kind of compiled it from two different sources. One was uh, Kentucky, had some uh, references on online for high tunnels. And I think I got some from Purdue University as well. So I kind of combined it from a couple different sources that had some publication and newsletters. Okay. <clears throat> no, would you mind if we could just get that table and then we could provide sure. just the table on, on the website too? Uh, and I'll be probably putting something similar in my fact sheet. Excellent. Yeah. And then we have a question on diatomaceous earth. It says, what is your opinion on using diatomaceous earth as an initial control solution? Yes, um, <clears throat> that will work against mites. Um, in fact, I read one paper where they were com combining diatomaceous earth, which is little crystals that get... In co come into contact with diatomaceous earth, so it's little um, crystals of, um, and they get attached to the insect body as they crawl on the ground, and that causes the cuticle to have holes in it, and it also gets caught in their, well, their spiracles or their noses. Um, and then causes breathing problem or respiratory problems. So yeah, that can work against mites and other insects that you might have. And one research paper I read uh, combined using diatomaceous earth with that Bavaria, and they felt that that would increase the fungal entopathogen getting into the body of the insect, but they didn't find that relationship. Okay. 
And then, of course, we'd want to remind people that if they are applying diatomaceous earth, it's good to, to wear a mask while you're doing so because you don't yes. want to be breathing, it, ah, breathing no. in those particles. No, it, it could do the same to us, cause us to have some respiratory problems. They're very small little uh, uh, particles that can get in. And then I had another question emailed to me. If we sprayed a lot of one chemical last season, are the mites that carry over the winter likely to be resistant to those chemicals? It's hard to say. If you were seeing um, problems with um, controlling the mites, you may have resistance. If you were getting good control, and I would say good control is um, like 80% for mites. Uh, your mites are so difficult to control, you'll never get you know, close to 100%. So we consider 80% good control when we're talking about mites. Um, so if you did start, if you were seeing poor control last year and you know it wasn't due to your application technique or coverage, or you were spraying during the heat of the day. I didn't mention it, but many insecticides break down fast, like the parethroid in insecticides by Fenthrin, uh, break down fast during the heat of the day. And uh, we the don't recommend. You asked me. Oops. Um, we don't recommend spraying when it's above ninety. You know, wait till it's cooler in the evenings. You'll get better residual. Whoops. Sorry, I, there we go. <clears throat> Whoops, Jan, I, I think I screwed up the mute button here, so I need to unmute everybody. I was trying, to, I was trying to unmute our participants so they could ask questions, so. I will forward that information, Whoops. Whoops. and uh, if you have any questions, you can. Okay, so if anybody has questions, I have unmuted your microphone, so please feel free to jump in and ask Jan some questions here. I see there's one on sulfur burners. Oh. I'm not really familiar with sulfur burners. Um, I'm assuming that's like a fogger. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, <clears throat> I'm not I think sure we... how well fogger would work for mites. Um, it, it would be something you'd have to try. Yes, and I think we use that more for powdery mildew. Has anybody yeah. else had good control with um, using the sulfur burners? See, any, any questions out there? You know, please feel free to type them in the chat box or, or use your microphone and ask the questions. Well, Jan, I wanted to ask you how common the tomato russet mite is. I mean, are we st starting to see that more in North Dakota? I think I've seen it. Yeah, I think I have too. In fact, I think I misdiagnosed a sample that came into the diagnostic lab last year. And because uh, I wasn't as familiar with that darkening um, a symptom, so but I don't know it's the the tomato russet mite and the broad mite are not as common as the two spotted mite. That's by far our most common species, the two spotted mite. But I ha I have seen that russeting right on the tomato fruit, um, just yeah. a couple of times. So I, I think I think it must be here. Yes, yeah. They're all all these three species I talked about are cosmopolitan mm -hmm. in their distribution. So they're everywhere. <laughs> if the if the uh, you know growing conditions are right and they have the right host plants. And we could likely if if you're getting transplants from you know the south. Uh, you could likely bring it up. I don't know how well it will survive here. I... All right, I'll check the chat chat box. <clears throat> All right, any any questions for Jan? This is your this is your opportunity. 
No? Let's see. Well, Jan, I want to thank you uh, for presenting. I mean, this was very informative, and, and this is a very important pest for us, particularly with the close proximity that some high tunnels are to soybean fields and, and to other fields. Um, but I also wanted to share something. So, Jan, um, would you mind taking down your PowerPoint? And I'm going to share uh, an announcement for our high tunnel conference. <clears throat> All right, so I am just going to bring up my PowerPoint here and and share that with you. Um, okay, there's my, I lost my mouse there for a while. Okay, so hopefully you can see this. Um, <clears throat> here, I'll go to slideshow. So we are having our NDSU High Tunnel Workshop this month on Saturday, April 28th uh, from 9 to 5 a.m. And this will be on our campus um, in our big lecture hall 114. Now we are offering a price break for the workshop. If you register by April 20th, it's $50. And then after that, registration will increase to $100. So if you register between April 21st and the 26th, it's $100. If you, you can register at the door and it will also be 100 and we would need a check at that time. We can't take credit cards. The reason that it becomes so much higher is that we then have to deal with um, buying in special food. Um, so, so we will be providing, we'll be providing lunch and snacks during this event, but it gets a lot higher if we don't have advance notice and it makes it really hard to plan for that. So we do prefer if people can register before April 20th. Um, I'll be sending out a, a link today. Um, and then, here, let, this, is, um, this is the agenda. So we're, um, Harleen Hatterman Valenti, um, has actually organized this event. Harleen, if you like, you know, turn on your microphone. But she has organized a, a very nice event. We've got Dr. Lewis Jett from West Virginia, <clears throat> Matthew Kleinhans from The Ohio State University, and Sarah Broch uh, from the University of Minnesota. They'll be appearing uh, via webinar te technology. So we're going to be using Zoom for those speakers. And then our in-person speakers will be uh, Dr. Hatterman Valenti, um, Dr. Garden Robinson, and then Tim Gienert, who, who, I'm, who I'm sure you probably met at the last conference. And he's going to be talking about vegetable cultivars. <clears throat> so any questions on our workshop? And we're hoping, um, hoping that you'll be able to tour our new high tunnel. So we're going to be constructing a high tunnel on campus this month. But Harleen, am I missing anything here? Nope, I think you covered it. This is Drew up here in Williston. Uh, uh, thank you. Great seminar. How's the uh, weather uh, affecting your high tunnel <laughs> construction? <laughs> It has definitely slowed us down, but we are hopeful that this will get built before the 28th. Uh, so we've, Harleen has got a great crew and they've got everything planned. As soon as we can get a couple warm days, they'll be in constructing this and, and they've got this down to a science. <laughs> well, good luck. Thank you, Drew. You can come down and help us. <laughs> All right, if there are no questions, I want to thank Jan again for, for joining us. Um, and we will be posting the recording online so you can go and, and listen to parts of this again because I know that there was a lot of good information here. All right, thank you very much. And everyone, just stay warm. Thank you. You're welcome. <clears throat>